And welcome back to Pam on the Pitch, you guys. I am your host, Pamela. And oh my goodness, was the last few days in the soccer world absolutely bonkers, I tell you. Absolutely wild, you guys. I'm going to start off with saying if you follow anything in soccer, Gareth Bale is a name that you heard a lot about. Now, Gareth Bale, who played in Europe, well, yeah, played in Europe, is now going to be playing for Major League Soccer. I repeat, he is now going to be playing for MLS, which is not only huge for the league, this is going to garner more attention and more eyes for all the other players that have been thinking about coming to MLS. Now they're going to want to come to the MLS. You guys have no idea how big this is. This was a huge step in the right direction for Major League Soccer. On top of the fact, what, a week ago now, Apple had a huge signing with Major League Soccer to have the rights to be able to promote it throughout, I think it's for three years, it's like a three-year contract. Um, Yeah, Major League Soccer, we have been talking about it, we've been knocking at the door, we've been wanting to finally be accepted, and I think the time is now, and if you are not following along, you are going to miss the train, but we will talk about all about Gareth Bale with my guest. We are having Chris Winger join me today. He played for Major League Soccer for 14 magnificent years. Now he's going to be joining us on Pam on the Pitch, and I'm going to pick his brain regarding what is happening in Major League Soccer and what is happening with Gareth Bale, because I think that we are beginning to see a lot of movements, you guys, and I am telling you, and I've been saying this, Lionel Messi is next. He is coming to Inter-Miami. You are hearing it here first. I guarantee this. Next season, we are going to see Messi here, and I think Gareth Bale is the beginning of that. And I don't think it's going to be the end. I see Sergio Ramos. I see maybe even Neymar. Neymar for LA Galaxy. Where can I start? Like, where can I start that? I can manifest that. I'm going to manifest Neymar with LA Galaxy. Could you imagine Ronaldo out here? I mean, possibilities are endless, you guys. Possibilities are endless. And Gareth Bale, I thank you for that. Now let's welcome my guest, Chris Wingert. Hey, Chris, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome to Pam on the Pitch. Thank you so much for joining us. No problem. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yes, of course. Where are you right now? Are you on the East Coast? Just got back to New York City. Yeah. Yeah, I I looked like it. It looked like it in the background. I was like, I think that's New York. Yeah. Yeah. Is that where you're calling home now? Uh, I'm a little bit homeless, a little bit of a nomad. I'll be back out on the West Coast soon. But yeah, I kind of split the year between uh between new york city and and california so you know i feel like every time i ask you that you always say the same thing i'm kind of all over the place i'm kind of a nomad weren't you living overseas for a little bit too summer of 2019 uh yeah summer before before the pandemic i was in uh i was in europe for that whole summer uh based in london but spent about a month in germany and uh yeah that was was, yeah it was a great experience so does rock your what is it rock nation not rock nation what is it rock yeah it is it rock it's rock nation yeah <laughs> my memory has not failed me yeah. rock nation are they based in new york or you can you be a nomad with them uh we have an office in in la and hollywood we had an office in new york city chelsea area and an office in london as well Dang, <clears throat> so, so you really you could be a nomad it's yeah. part of your job yeah exactly good thing you, good thing you played soccer Exactly. It's not not the worst places to be for (laughs) personal reasons, too. Very true. Very true. Well, Chris, we do have an audience here. We have some people in the chat um, who do not know you as well as I do know you. So we're going to dive in, okay? We're going to go back to where it all began. Why don't you tell us who you are and where soccer came to be a part of your life? Because I know your dad played professionally, correct? That's correct. Yeah, he played back. In the, the 1970s, back in the old NASL, uh, most people know the Cosmos. He played against the Cosmos, but he played for Philadelphia for the Adams for a bit before retiring. It was a completely different world back then. He was making peanuts, uh, and he started teaching and ended up keeping a teaching job um, and lived on Long Island, and uh, that's where I grew up my whole life. My parents are still in the same house. And wow. I up, yeah, I ended up going uh, to St. John's University in Queens in New York City, not just over the bridge here from where I am now. And uh, I ended up playing all four years of college. Most guys were starting to leave school early right around that time. I'm the same age as like, 
Landon Donovan, Marcus Beasley, Kyle Beckerman, those guys, they got offered contracts straight out of high school, but I wasn't on that national team at the time. And I really needed to go to, to college first, but then we started playing the Olympic team together, the U23s, and they were really pushing us all to leave school early. But I ended up being the only guy on the team that stayed all four years. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just wasn't, it, I, it wasn't that enticing. <laughs> they were offering us like, I think the offer I got was like $28,000 to to leave school well, that early. That sounds about right. I mean, I, when I remember falling, beginning to follow Major League Soccer and talking about it when I was like in high school, yeah. everyone would be like, those guys make like 6000 a year. And I'm like, what? Yeah, some guys made less than that 28 that I was talking about. My, my best buddy <laughs> who played on the Galaxy was on what was called the developmental contract. And at the time, I think it was $18,000. Imagine trying to live in LA for $18,000. Dude, you know what's even more sad is that's what like minor league players make, but that's like the minor league team and that's playing for major league soccer. Like you're the highest level you can get in the U.S. and they're paying you that. So good. I well, know. It's a bit different now, unfortunately. Not, not, it's not definitely not better now. Anymore, but yeah, the, uh, the salaries just came out uh, about a month ago. I think the average salary for non-designated players, so that's not even including the millionaires on each team. Uh, I think the average salary was like, 420 or 430 so that's pretty good that's amazing that a, you want to come out of retirement now what was that you said you, are you ready to come out of retirement now yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah i don't think my, my old man back is ready but my hey my, i heard a lot of rumors here and yeah. i always i always say hey i think uh i think my guests are free agents now it's never too late <laughs> to come back never too late well really? chris how old were you when you like first remember playing soccer like at um, what age were you like, this is, this is my life. This is what I love. Yeah. Don't remember, you know, first starting, I mean, probably four or five. Um, there was never really a time when I wasn't playing, but I would say that uh, I knew from an early age that I wanted to be a professional athlete. And I think I absolutely love soccer, but when people ask, I usually say that I don't know if soccer is necessarily, I loved it more than basketball or some of the other sports that I played, but I was better at it, so you get a little bit more attention, right? Uh, and you think that it's your favorite. Okay. And so when you're, yeah, and, and and then as as you grow up a little bit, you're starting to realize, okay, maybe if I do have a chance to make it, it's probably going to be in for me soccer. And so I was going to, you know, really focus on that and continue. I'm a, I'm I'm a total advocate of young players playing other sports if they want to. Uh, I did growing up, and and I don't regret any of that at all. I think it it, it helped me personally. Um, nowadays they really push for, you know, all the kids to be playing all year round and not play any other sports from the time they're like seven or eight, which I think is absurd. Um, but for me, it was really junior high and high school when, uh, you know, when the focus was primarily on soccer and I kind of stopped playing those other sports, at least consistently. I would so that's kind of when it clicked for you? Like I could, I could yeah. do that. Yeah, that, that, so, so we tried out for that, uh, U17 national team when I was, 15 at the time when we were freshmen in high school and all those guys made it that I was referring to before actually Landon didn't come to the following year but DeMarcus was there Kyle Beckerman these guys I grew up with and um and I didn't make that team and that that really kind of drove me to yeah to push and I can remember my dad was always into it and we'd train a ton just him and I aside aside from the team stuff and uh and up until that point, it was kind of him pushing and saying, hey, let's go play. Let's go play. And some, you know, a lot of times I would go, sometimes I would resist. And after that year, I can remember when I was turning 15, it was then it kind of turned the tides. And it was really me asking him, hey, let's go train. Let's go train. And uh, I don't think I realized that I was definitely going to be a pro until I was probably a sophomore in college was when I started playing for, for the U23 national team, the Olympic team. And all these guys were, were going pro or some of them were already were pros. And that was kind of when it hit me when I was like, okay, if I'm on this level, then it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Hold on. Give me one second. Can you hear that? <laughs> Hold on, Chris. I could, can you hear that too? Could everyone hear that? No, just Nick and I. Yeah. I think that was just us. <laughs> my, my phone's connected to like the headset over there. And my grandma was calling me, you guys. I'm so sorry to everybody who's watching this. But you're talking, all I hear is, da -da 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 -da. It's like, oh, yeah, I was like, can, can everyone hear that? Or is that just me? You heard that too, Nick? 
Yeah, I think it just came through the soundboard. Oh, dude, next time I get a call, by all means, come around the table and go ahead and decline. It's just my grandma. Hey, grandma. Hi, yeah. grandma. I'm taking her to go see Elvis tonight. That's why we pushed my show up an hour, because um, we have a hot date tonight okay. for her 85th birthday. Whoa. Dying in birthday. movie theater. Happy birthday, grandma. That's I awesome. know, 85 and feeling fine. I'm trying to set her up on a blind date with someone, so if you know anyone... <laughs> Yes. Oh, yes. My grandma's on the market. She is a dime. That's she amazing. walked with brand new knees so she can walk miles now. She can go yeah. dancing. <laughs> so if you know anyone, age range is ideally. She tends to go for younger men. I would like anywhere between 75 to 85, I'd say. All right. All right. I'll, I'll send you a picture later. Okay. I'll have a, a good think about this. Please do. She's okay. <laughs> she, I don't want to relocate her. So if you know someone in New York, send them this way. Oh, she is she in LA? She's in LA, yeah. <laughs> okay so back to it back to it so I was gonna actually ask you about your dad was he a pretty big influence on your career I mean he obviously played but he played during a different time where it was very MLS for a long time just wasn't taken seriously even I'm sure when you first got into the league to what it is now it just wasn't it took a long time and it's still a work in progress but when your dad played it was even more behind times so how did he feel about you wanting to go pro? Like, was he supportive? Did he help you like get there? Did he also believe like this would be like the right path for you? Cause I know he walked away from it. Yeah, he did. No, he, he, he absolutely did. He definitely pushed me towards it, but in a gentle way, not uh, overbearing. Like we see with a lot of, of youth sports nowadays, unfortunately. Um, he, I, 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 looking back, he, he found a, I thought a great balance of kind of, trying to push me and, and make sure that I had all the opportunities. Um, but at the same time, he would have been fine if that wasn't the case. So I went in another direction. I, he played a bunch of different sports as well. And like I said, I did too. Um, but it, it, once he, he kind of saw that it was coming from within and that that was something that I wanted, then he was going to drive me to the end of the earth and, and try to find, you know, all the opportunities possible that uh, would help make it a, a real, you know, possibility in the future. So. Well, I ended up becoming a possibility. So one shout out to your dad. I think that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. um, I love, love, love hearing like the parental influence that a lot of you players have had um, because I think there is something special about having parents that just want to see the best, you know, for their kid. And that's all they want to do is like try and guide you, I guess, guide you without pushing you. No, my parents were amazing. My mom was definitely was all about discipline and hard work, but more so in the classroom. Uh, everybody in my, my family's teachers. My sister's still a teacher. My parents are retired now, but my mom taught. My dad taught school. So I think he saw both sides. My mom was begging me not to leave college early uh, when I got that, that offer to leave school early. But my dad, I think, understood both sides. He's like, obviously, I wanted to, to become a pro as soon as possible and, uh, you know, brag to my friends that I was, I was looking <laughs> cool. That you're reality, like 20, 20 years old with a professional contract. <laughs> yeah, in reality, it just didn't quite make sense at the time. Yeah. So my mom was was pumped that I that I stayed and graduated, but uh, I think my dad was very understanding of, of both sides. Either way, you would have gone. Yeah. Yeah, That's but he point. but he for sure uh, was was living his career vicariously through me. You know, once I started playing. So why don't you walk me through then that moment when you did get drafted to Columbus crew. How was that experience? Do you remember that pretty vividly? And yeah, like, well, I remember what was feeling like, I remember it because, um, I was training with the Olympic team. We were training for Olympic qualifying. So I wasn't there. Um, so we were you actually were even at, there in person. <laughs> you know where we were, we were actually in Manhattan beach at that Manhattan beach Marriott, which is now the, the West uh, Rift, I think. Yes. Yes. That's where we were. I literally had just got back from training and got a phone call. Like wasn't able to watch or didn't even know because I was literally out at training. So I, of course I knew it was going to happen. I didn't know exactly where to. And where? Yeah. With uh, who? And ironically, my roommate at the time, Chad Marshall, uh, who I think I'm going to bring up later in the show because uh, because he's a, a big time player that that never played in the World Cup, but for me is Along there. one of the all-time greats. And and uh, he was my roommate at the time, and we both got drafted to Columbus, so that was pretty cool. Wow, that's a, so how'd you find out? Who yeah. called you? Uh, I mean, I'm sure I had like a million texts. <laughs> um, 
and and calls at the time. I think I was literally in the van on the way back from from uh, from Carson from uh, at the time what was I guess the Home Depot Center. I was going to say the Home Depot uh, training facility right there. Facility and uh, yeah, I don't even remember. I just um, yeah, I went I went twelve to Columbus and I believe Nick Gravelboy, who ended up being my teammate for a long time, went thirteen. And he was on that team as well. So, of so course, how was it uh, being able to make that phone call to your parents, especially? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah they, they probably knew before I did, but um, yeah, it was really cool. I mean, I would say um, that kind of felt a little bit inevitable, or at least there was like uh, for a month or two before that, I guess. Um, but there was some some really special moments. Um, the first time I got called in. To the national team both times with the first time with the Olympic team and then with the full national team first and only time I was at home because uh, it was right around Christmas and uh, that was ridiculous uh, <laughs> to, get that, to get that phone call one was a phone call one was an email um, and to get that with my parents was that was probably the biggest personal celebration yeah, one of the like, one of the fond mo- memories that you do yeah. have with them. That's sure. amazing. That's true. I mean, I guess of all the calls that I'm sure you've gotten throughout your career, those are pretty big ones to be getting with your for individual. You know, for individual stuff, that's that's as big as it gets. Certainly, national team stuff, I think, is the biggest honor for us. Yeah. Oh yeah, to be able to represent your country. I mean, you really can't want more than that. Yeah. Yeah, so no, then going to Columbus crew, I know um, you spent most of your career somewhere else, but what was that first season like? I mean, it's your first it professional incredible. season. Yeah, I loved it. We had, And we had a great team. We, we actually won the Supporter Shield. We went 18 games unbeaten, I think, and finished in first place. And um, Robin Frazier, who was later my coach for a while, was the captain of our team. And he really took me under his wing, Chad and I, um, as kind of young defenders on the team and, and – um, he was really a mentor for me and, and still is, to be honest, uh, to this day, we still keep in touch. And, and he was a, a massive reason that I ended up going to Salt Lake years later because he was there. Um, and the other, the other veteran guys were amazing. I mean, we had, it was a great group of guys, Simon Elliott, Duncan Houghton was still young at the time, but had been there for a bit, uh, Ross Pauly, all these guys. And then, and we had great core group of young guys. Kyle Martino was coming off of being rookie of the year a couple of years before that. Edson Buttle, who later played in the World Cup, big time forward. Um, Chad was probably the best young defender in the league. Um, we had a, a really good kind of balance of veteran and young guys and, and a great team that year. So when I was there, I thought Columbus was amazing. I was like, the city's amazing. <laughs> and then I think when I left, I was like, ah, maybe it wasn't that cool. <laughs> Really you're like, this is going to be my home for years to come. And you're yeah, like, I, thought, I thought I was going to be there for 10 years because I wasn't making much money, but I was starting pretty much every game. So I was like, there's so no. When you did get traded, obviously yeah. you weren't expecting that, expecting that. So what was that call like? Yeah, so I've, so, heard, I've heard from different players that it goes one or two ways. You either fully see it coming and you're like, I'm probably going to get traded. Or you're getting off a plane, getting told by someone from a different team, hey, you're coming out to Real Salt Lake. Like, pack your bags. You're going to come play for us this this Friday. Yeah, that's, so that's was- I've, I've, I've had both. <laughs> but that time, but that, and the big joke amongst us, I had, I had just bought a small condo. Real estate was so cheap back then. And the big joke amongst the guys is like, as soon as you buy a place, you're getting traded. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. But I, uh, I wasn't completely shocked because what happened was the second year we didn't have a great season uh but again i I just figured that i was going to still be there for the reasons that i said which is i wasn't making a ton of money but i was playing every game so like pretty much every game so the two reasons why they usually want to get rid of you are if you're not that good or if you're you're getting too expensive for uh for the salary cap so uh but what happened was they fired the coach and they hired ziggy schmidt and when Ziggy came in, I think he just wanted his own team. He literally cleaned house. The only guys that stayed were Chad Marshall, Frankie Haduck, and Duncan, I think, were the only guys that stayed for at least, like, a couple of years after that. Pretty much everybody wow. else, yeah, he cleaned house. So, um, yeah, he called uh, right before preseason in January and said, we traded you to Colorado. And at that point, I was young, you know, so I didn't really have a say in the league. 
later on in my career, um, you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough where the teams kind of let me have a say uh, and where I wanted to go. But in this case, he called me up and Beckerman was one of my closest friends at the time and was already there. And, um, and Nat Borchers, who I later played with for years, had left. And they brought me in to really play next to Mike Pecky as the other center back who was went to my high school. Mike was kind of like my local idol growing up. No um, way. So I had known Mike since I was a little kid. Uh, so I was like, this is great. What a cool opportunity. And Colorado uh, is beautiful. I love Denver. Denver was, of the three cities uh, of Salt Lake, Columbus, and, and Denver, the three places that I played, Denver was by far um, the coolest actual city. But was just, it just didn't work out for me. Me and the coach just didn't really get along. It's not, it's not that we didn't get along. He just didn't think I was that good. <laughs> so yeah. we got along fine. Um, but I was just sitting the bench most of the time and, and, oh, then I play. Like, what's the point? I'm not playing. Yeah. And so, and I think for him, he was thinking what I was saying before, which is like, if we need Chris, we can use him and he's not making that much money, but we don't, you know, if we don't need him, he's not going to be a cancer in the locker room. Um, but I had come off of playing pretty much every game my first couple of years. So I was like, man, this is a total step back. And I was asking to leave, asking to leave. And they were resisting and then finally I got an opportunity to leave the following year. Um, and that's a long story. I don't think we have enough time, but I was actually on a, a flight heading to LA. I was supposed to sign with the galaxy and arrive the same day as Beckham. Literally. This is two what? Yeah. It's a crazy story. So uh, you can cut me We're off. Making time. No, we are making time. We are making time. If I have to bring you back for another episode, <laughs> to do the second portion. I have no problem with that. This I'm hearing the story where everyone's story. listening. We got Mickey in here. We got Stephanie, Ben. I saw Bunk in there earlier. Everyone, we're all yours. Okay. Lamb Chopper, you ready? We're listening. Chris, tell us. The so, story. so what happened was they used to have the contracts were semi-guaranteed, which is a total oxymoron, which is ridiculous. And what that meant was if they cut you before July 1st, they'd have to pay you the rest of the season. So the end of June was always like a really anxious time for, you know, a lot of guys. <laughs> So I had been I had been playing a bit, but like on and off in Colorado. This is June of 20, 2007, excuse me. And um, so we went to D.C. on a Thursday. Two days before that, the coach had come up to me and said, hey, we might need you to sign this extension. So instead of July 1st, they could move it back to September 1st. So basically you, you were in, you know, uh, this waiting game for another two months of like they could cut you for another two months and, you know, not get paid for the rest of the year. So it was terrible. And I was looking to leave for months before that. So when the coach asked me to sign that extension, I said, no, I'm not signing it. And the next day he came up, he said, oh, it's okay. We don't need you to sign it. It's something that fell through with another player that they wanted to bring in. So that Thursday we went down to DC. I played the whole game. We won. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to start. We flew straight to Chicago. We're supposed to have a game in Chicago on a Sunday, Friday night, I'm going to the John Mayer concert in Chicago with a couple buddies and we have like a low key day, right? It's Tom <laughs> Martino's brother. And then my buddy, yeah, true story. And then my buddy, Logan Paws. And uh, the admin comes in the hallway and gives me that same contract, the extension. And I said, I was on the phone with my best buddy. And uh, I said, hey, hold on a second. I was like, oh, I talked to the coach. He said, I don't want to sign this. And he was like, when did, you, when did he say that? It's like two days ago. He's like, he just gave this to me five minutes ago. So I'm like, oh, man. So I go up, talk to him. He's like, yeah, we're going to need you to sign it. And I'm like, I'm not signing it. And he's like, we're going to have to cut you. And I'm like, cool. Like, whatever. I've been asking to leave. And they were like, well, what if you don't get picked up by another team? And I'm like, I'll move on with my life. I don't know. I'm not, like, begging to be here, you know? Like, I don't know what to tell you. So now I'm like. Hey, that's very ballsy. Oh, no, Chris. Well, I was like, I'm not, again, like, I don't want to be somewhere where I'm not wanting. Yeah. I wasn't going to be there. So I was, it was just ridiculous. I was still playing. I'm like, but you don't even want to pay me. Like whatever I was making, it was just like close to minimum salary. It was ridiculous. So, so now I'm like, time. I'm cut from the team. And what am I doing? I'm like, am I, we had like a regen workout session. I'm like, do I go? Am I even on the team anymore? It's so weird. So I went to John Mayer concert that night. I woke up the next day in Chicago, like what's going on in my life? Like, I don't have a job, you know, whatever. So I, I flew home to New York and Kyle Martino was in Los Angeles and Chris Albright, who's now the sporting director of Cincinnati was the, the right back at the time on the galaxy. And he had just torn his ACL. So they really wanted me. 
So they called me and were like, hey, it's Frank Yallop was a coach. He said, come out. Um, you know, they just want to make sure I was healthy and whatever. I was going to I was going to play on the team. So I, I flew from New York. My parents had stopped in Denver to pick up my stuff. And I had a call from Robin Frazier, who I was talking about before, who now is the assistant coach at Salt Lake at this time. And I have a message and he's like, where are you? What's going on? Call me right away. So I call him and he's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm going to sign with the Galaxy. And he's like, did you sign already? And I said, no, I'm just picking up my stuff and I'm going out there tomorrow. And he was like, come to Salt Lake instead. And I was like, oh. Uh, and now my head, I'm like, oh. Salt Lake, worst team in the league. LA Galaxy, best team in the league. David Beckham's literally coming tomorrow, like whatever. But I was like, what happens when Chris Albright gets healthy? And I just didn't kind of trust that situation. Like, uh, I went true. to Salt Lake. I'm like, I'm going to be one of the better players on the team. At the, at the time, they were terrible. I know and you playing time. And Jason you. Christ had just taken over, and Robin Frazier was there, who I know really liked me and would look out for me. And, and I'm like, I just want a place where I can be for a while and really establish a career, right? So long story short, I called Frank Gallup, who's the coach of the Galaxy, and told him, hey, I'm like, Considering going to Salt Lake, I, I flew there to meet with them, and he was so nice. I could tell he was thinking, like, are you an idiot, kid? Like, you could be out here in Los Angeles with Beckham and all this stuff, and you want to go to Salt Lake? Like, do whatever you want. Like, you know, he, I could tell he was super cool, but I could tell he was thinking, like, yeah, whatever. What are you doing? Yeah, and um, and I obviously I signed with Salt Lake, and then the next few months was hell. I was in this like podunk motel in Salt Lake. And I'm talking to Martino all the time. He's like one of my best friends. And he's like, oh, yeah, last night we were with, you know, Kanye West. And, you know, this night we we're with Tom Cruise and, and Will Smith. And we got an invitation to a locker. And we were just in New York last night. And Beckham brought me and Albright and Kobe. And we, like, went down and hung out with John Mayer and Alicia Keys and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, it's totally real. You're like, what have I done? The only thing I can do is go to Applebee's in Salt Lake. It's literally like, I'm like, I completely blew it. But in hindsight, it worked out great. Obviously, I was there for 10 years. We actually ended up beating them in the in MLS Cup in 09. And uh, and literally a few days after I had gotten traded there, Kyle Beckham got traded there completely separate. Which is who was one of your friends at the time. My closest friend and, and the best player on our team, our captain. And totally, I mean, Dave Checkett's our our old owner and, and uh, Jason Christ and everybody would say that was the real turning point for the team was, you know, Kyle coming on board. And that was the beginning of, of really overhauling the team. And, and we were really good for about a five year span. So anyway, that yeah, was a long I story. Say, but... I know that real Salt Lake was your home. Everything that I was yeah. reading about you, that was home for you. So I think obviously in hindsight, would LA, the LA experience with Beckham would ha have been cool. I'm sure, yeah. but yeah. you did establish a career and a home, which is what you wanted. I mean, you ended up getting a championship with them. So all in all, I think it, it led to you having a 14 year long career and for any athlete that in itself is an accomplishment. No, thanks. And that, and that's the, I, I tell all the young guys that I'm like, look for the Messi's and Ronaldo's of the world. Sure. It doesn't matter who the coach is for the rest of us. Soccer is not like baseball or basketball, these other American sports where it's all stat based. Right. So it's so much perception. So you have to have the, the, the coach has to like you. You have to be somewhere where the coach likes you and believes in you and is going to give you a chance. And for me, that was Jason Christ. And then I followed him around for, you know, 10 years and made a career out of it. Um, but that was the key. You know, I, I obviously got cut from a team in Colorado and I thought that I deserved better than that. But I needed to find a coach and a, a system, um, a, a staff who believed in me. And, and for me, that was in, in Salt Lake. So it worked out. That's amazing. You know, it's interesting that you say that about wanting to find a coach that believes in you because Marvell Wynn was on the episode last week and his dad played major league baseball. So his dad, you know, was very big influence with getting traded, getting cut the whole thing that you also, most athletes are going to go through it. Like you said, unless you're a Messi or a Beckham, you're going to get cut at one point, you're going to get traded. And he said that his dad's advice from the very first trade wise be thankful another team wants you because it's the, it's the team that wants you is where you should go. Not the team who's holding on to you. It's the team who's asking for you. And I, I was like, that's so true. That's and you so only true. need the right team or the right coach. You only need one. That's yeah. it. I mean, literally like as long as it's obviously the right person and you know, the, the right situation, but 
you only need one. You don't, you can't play on 10 teams. So you don't need, you don't need 10 teams, you know what yeah. I mean? So that's the key. I tell all the guys, you know, it's like, you know, you got to try to find a situation and the guys that go to college, especially because there's so many factors in going to college, right? If it's a good academic school and the campus life and all this other stuff. And if, if you're going to be a college soccer player, I tell them all the time, like do everything you can do as much due diligence as possible to know that you and the coach are going to get along. Because if you don't get along with the coach, it's going to be almost impossible to enjoy your whole experience. If that's your priority with being a, a student athlete, it's to me by far the number one most important thing when looking into to where to go to school. So that's really good advice. I'm glad that you dropped that. Cause it's always one of my questions. What advice would you give to um, someone wanting to be in your shoes? And that is great advice. Now I do want to hold on to before we move forward. Cause I have a lot. Um, I want to try and get through, but you had a long career. 14 years is obviously no joke. Um, it's longer than what most athletes get to say they've done. Now, what was it like to win a championship for real Salt Lake? Obviously when you first got there, you're staying in a motel. I've been to Salt Lake. Um, it's it's very naturey. There's a lot of nature to go see. It's beautiful. It's clean air. Um, but the nightlife um, compared to an LA is very different. Um, hotels, all of it's different. It's just different. Nothing against it. It's just different styles. So what was it like to obviously eventually learn to love a city that you're in and then win a championship for them? Yeah, it was, it was amazing. I, honestly, Salt Lake, like you said, really is a second home for me. And I would have to say New York still feels most like home, but, but Salt Lake, uh, Utah was incredible for me. And that's why I ended up, I think if, if somebody had said to me when I first went there, you're going to be there for 10 years, I think I would have freaked out, but, <laughs> but it ended up being for a great reason. Um, uh, and also Salt Lake was a lot different in 2007 than it is in 2022. Um, it, you know, the, the whole, all the whole society was, was definitely in a different place than it is now for real. And, uh, and Kyle and I went, but he was, Kyle was great. And he just, this is his personality, but he basically, all the young guys on the team were like moving down South and, and buying homes because they could buy these big homes for cheap and which is great. But at the same time, he was like, we got a bunch of young guys on this team. Like let's get everybody downtown and at least hang out and enjoy each other and, and, you know, create some chemistry amongst the guys. And that's what we did. He, he really pushed that. And there's no doubt in my mind that that made a big difference. And then him and, and Javier Morales, who was really our best player for, for many years, along with, well, we had, a, we had a few, along with Kyle and Nick and a few of the guys, but, but Javi was really our, our, certainly our best attacking player and one of the best players in the league. And he did a great job with Kyle of kind of meshing um, the chemistry and making sure that all the guys kind of got along. And if you didn't get along, you were kind of an outcast and it probably wasn't going to work because they, they were so good at, at creating that camaraderie amongst the guys. And you could, you could feel that change in 2008. 2008, we had a really good season. We got upset in the semifinals by New York. We completely outplayed them and, and lost one nothing. Um, and going into 2009, I think we had a lot of confidence, but we actually didn't have a great regular season. We had a pretty average regular season, but in this weird way, uh, I think we had a lot of belief and especially that if we were playing at home, because we had established that we were really good at home. And so we played Columbus, who was, who was supporter shield winners first place in the first rounds, but the first game was a home and away. And the first game was at home. And we felt like we could win this and put all the pressure on them. We ended up beating them. Um, and really I felt like we deserved to, to win from there on uh, the game against LA was, was super close in a final, but was a phenomenal feeling. I think, you know, going back, we, it was a little bit of that mentality of like, you know, I know it sounds cliche and cheesy, but like us against the world type thing, because I think everybody was so enamored by the fact that Beckham and Landon and these guys were in LA and we were kind of afterthoughts, especially having just kind of snuck into the playoffs. Uh, so we hadn't really established ourselves as, as one of the top teams over the course of a, a couple of seasons. Um, but there was no doubt that there was a lot of belief in the locker room. And I don't think we were, we were surprised at all, but you know, it was still a really close game, obviously penalty kicks, but it was an amazing feeling. And then, and then we went on a run. And then I feel like 2010 and 2011, we were, we were really, really good. 2010 was our best team. Javi was incredible. Our defense, we didn't give up hardly any goals um, right up until the, the Champions League final. And unfortunately we lost one nothing at home. I, we we should have 
should have won that game and had a million chances, but didn't convert. And then a few weeks later, Javi destroyed his ankle in a game against Chivas. And that was it. You know, took a turn. But, oh, yeah. Chivas, RIP. <laughs> yeah, Goodbye. so it's, it's a good run and a great feeling. It was you know, an unbelievable feeling to win an MLS Cup. Well, I'm glad that you actually brought up um, Donovan and Beckham because uh, LA Galaxy during that time, especially, had a lot of notable players and a lot of very strong players. So as a defender, we're going to start getting into more of the exciting stuff. As a defender, who was one of the hardest people to defend against? Who were some um, of the strongest the players? The toughest, guy that I, the toughest guy that I played against was definitely Javinko. He was the hardest mark for me, hands down, in my time in the, in the league. Uh, now, look, there was guys that had better careers, right? I try to say this all the time. Um, you know, David Villa and, and, um, and Henri and these guys had, you know, better careers than, um, than Javinko did. But when they were here, they were a bit past their prime, um, whereas Javinko was still, I think, in his 20s. And, and uh, he could go right and left and shifty and could score all different ways. And I, he was one of the few guys that I felt like if he was lining me up, I was looking around like, who's going to come help me? Uh, he he told us a bunch. We went, we, the first time we went up to play them, because I was on New York City that year, 2015. And the first time we went up to play them, we did the scout the night before the game. And I left with the other center back, Jason Hernandez. And he looked at me and he was like, did we just watch a YouTube highlight video on Javinko? Like, that wasn't, it would have nothing to do with the rest of their team. Like, it was just like, this guy is a complete- And that's you had to defend? Oh, it was unbelievable. <laughs> he scored a hat trick on us in eight minutes and could have had, and I, and Robin Frazier was their coach at the time, their assistant. And I called him afterwards and I was like, man, that was crazy. And he was like, he could have had six goals. Like, he was like, we were actually disappointed that he didn't have six goals. And we were like, he was like, but then we're like, we can't really get mad. And he did have a hat trick in eight minutes. <laughs> he, for me, he was a completely different level. Um, than those guys, but uh, when you know when they were here, not yeah. uh, obviously. In terms wow, of I like that answer. I've heard so many different players throughout um, my last like a few episodes. That was that was a new one. Yeah, he was, was definitely the, the, the most difficult for me. And and when he was here, although the last couple years since I've been gone, when I retired, which was end of 2017, I thought he was the best player in, in the history of the league. Before that, I I thought it was Robbie Keane. Um, and then I thought, uh, I thought it was Javinko for, you know, meaning he was the best player during his time that in you that had span, you yeah. know, I'm not talking about a, you know, a whole career who had the best MLS career. I don't mean that. I just mean, yeah, I just mean your personal experience. You're yeah. on the pitch, your coach is like, that's who you're blocking. That's who you're on. I, when I played soccer and if I remember the same feeling, you look at them, you're like, oh, that's who I have to mark. That's, that's who you want me on. And he's not looking at him. I mean, he's literally like five, two, five, two, five, three, but he was just so shit. I used to kick him down or hold him and he'd he'd get up and look at me like, what are you doing? And I'd be like, what do you think? Like, I'm not going to keep up with you. Just trying to run after you. So yeah, I got to come up with something else here. Oh, I, you see, you got to do what you got to do, Chris. You got to do what you got to do. And sometimes all I'm going to slow him down is to get him down a little bit. You got to knock him down. Like, sorry, (laughs) I couldn't get you. (laughs) Bad. I'll help you up afterwards. But. So um, obviously I know that you um, have retired and what was it like when you did decide you were going to walk away because you were still involved in soccer, which is going to lead me to the next portion because it soccer has changed even since to the moment you retired in 2018. So what was it like when you decided you you were done? I'm retiring. I'm going to start something new, but you also didn't walk away from soccer. So walk me through that decision. Yeah, so 2017, which was my last, ended up being my last season, um, I thought, okay, this could be it. I actually didn't want to play one more year, and it just didn't work out. Um, the offer I got wasn't a good one, and, and um, so it was kind of it and decided to move on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, was a, it wasn't exactly my decision, if that makes sense, but, um, but I, I knew that 2017 might be it, and so I started to think about, okay, you know, what would I like to do? And having gone through the collective bargaining agreement and the negotiations between the union and the league, I was a rep for many years, uh, both in, in Salt Lake and, and in New York City. And having gone through that experience, it just kind of opened up my eyes to um, what I thought was true. Uh, maybe it reaffirmed, I should say, what I thought was true, which was 
Um, the players, I thought, needed some more advocates on their side. I felt like there was a handful of agents and there's a bunch of really great agents out there, but there was a, a handful for me and my buddies when we first came into the league that represented like 90% of the league. And for the players, that's not a good thing, right? Ultimately, you want there to be more options for the guys. And that's no one person's fault at all. But for the players, it's better if they have some different options and that there are people out there really looking out for their best interest and not necessarily um, the best interest of the teams or the league or, um, you know, growth of, of soccer in general. I think the, the individuals, um, those, those organizations um, and, and those movements, if you will, already have tons of people supporting them. And it's not that it has to be one or the other, but I was a big believer that the players really needed some more options when it came to representation. So I was, I was kind of considering what's, what's the best way that I can help. Is it to, to be an agent, to join an agency, to start my own agency, to potentially work for the union. Um, I did look into some front office jobs as well. I got offered a couple of, of positions at front office that didn't quite pan out. Um, and I ended up as with most businesses, if you, if you started on your own, uh, everything's coming out of pocket and it's difficult to establish yourself, yourself right? Uh, but at the same time, I didn't really want to join one of these so-called big agencies where they had a million clients because that was kind of going against what I stood for, which was I really felt like each individual should get that personalized attention and somebody out there looking, for that, uh, looking out for them, not necessarily where they had 200 clients and this young player is going to be number 190 on the totem pole. So uh, I ended up joining an agency with a couple of guys I used to play with in, in Columbus. Well, one guy played in Columbus and then the other guy in DC, great guys. Uh, and I worked with them for a few years. And then uh, just this past year, a gentleman by the name of Alan Redman was heading Rock Nations football, international football, soccer, as we say, um, over in London. And they wanted to expand in the US and in North America and he called and was like, hey, do you want to to, to expand this group and, and head it over in North America. And I said, yeah, it sounds great. So uh, after meeting with them, uh, the presidents and, and one of the owners, not Jay-Z, but uh, one of the other owners, Juan Perez, uh, what they had to say just really fit in with what I was trying to accomplish. Um, they don't want to have a big clientele in terms of numbers. Um, they want to be really selective with, with who we speak to and who we try to work with. And that was what I was all about. Um, so that it wasn't a situation where they were trying to bring in a hundred clients and, and it was really more of a numbers game. It's not that at all. And, um, and that's not what I believe in. So when I, when I saw that we were really on the same page with that, then I was, then I was excited about the opportunity because of, of the opportunities and, and the doors that Rock Nation, I think can open up for the clients. So it's been great. I love that. Well, congratulations on your new adventure. Um, I think that one, when you love something like such as soccer, it's something that was a part of your life and has been a part of your life for so long. And you're right. I think in all sports, especially, especially in soccer, because we are so much later to getting to the same support that Major League Baseball has or that the NFL has or the NBA has, we didn't have a lot of support for a long time. So I think it is going to take people like you and so many other people that I've talked to where you've played it, you know where it comes from and you know what needs to happen in order to grow the sport the right way. So that is going to be the next phase is where do you see soccer growing? Where do you feel like we still need change to be able to get it where it should have been a long time ago? Well, the biggest thing in professional sports is, is TV rights deals, as we know. So, Which Apple TV just did a big one. Yeah, yeah, they did. And I think it's a positive but I think there's two sides to that as well. And I can't okay. pretend to know the, the deal that intimately, um, but just looking into it a little bit, um, I think it's slightly misleading. It, it's, it's overall, it's definitely a positive and it's great because we're really putting people in the stands now, as we see with all these sold out stadiums, right? Yeah. But our TV ratings have not been good at all, all things considered. So to sign a significant deal like this with Apple is tremendous. But at the same time, when we signed the last deal, I believe we had 18 teams. Mm -hmm. And I want to say it was somewhere around 65 million. 
but now and now that it's going to be like 250 i think it's gonna be closer to 300 million with when espn and fox are, are done because they're going to be a, a small part um is, is my understanding but there's gonna be 30 teams right so instead of it being like four and a half x at, at first glance it's probably closer to i don't know three x something like that um which is great uh, it, it is. It really is. It's a good jump and it's better than the numbers that I was originally hearing about six months ago. So I think it's a good thing. Uh, but I think some is yet to be determined, right? If if we take a big jump um, in terms of notoriety and and buzz around the league and, and where we're at after 2026 and having the World Cup here like we expect to do and hope to do, does that mean that the second half of the deal maybe doesn't look as great then? Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just speculating. And also, um, there could be some clauses in that in the, the deal with Apple that say, you know, if we're if we're doing well and hitting certain echelons that um, the deal gets gets jumped up. So, again, I, I don't know um, all the specifics. Ultimately, I do think it's a, a good deal for the league and very exciting. Absolutely. I think it's just, but good, some of good, exposure. I think it's just good exposure because, like you said, uh, for a, a very long time, you couldn't even go into some bars. And like find a, a channel with a LA Galaxy game in LA. In yeah. LA, they just oh, it can't find it because it's on a subscription of ESPN Plus. You know, yeah. so it was very complicated for a long time. So I agree. I think TV exposure was lacking, and I think we're starting to finally find momentum there. I hope the Apple TV deal helps. Um, I think at least worldwide yeah. people can watch. Now, when you're in London, just throw on yeah. your Apple TV and you can watch it. Yeah, exactly. You know, I will be. <laughs> um, and then as for the growth of MLS, um, from when you played to where it's at now, I mean, the Gareth Bale signing has been the talk of the last few days. Um, it absolutely blew my mind in more ways than one. One side of it is that I think this is a big step for Major League Soccer. I think to get a name like his, I mean, granted, yes, we've had Ibrahimovic here. We've had Beckham and Beckham paved the way, in my opinion, for all of this to happen. He's the beginning. He's the reason why all these players are coming. However, I think this is the start of all those players like Gareth Bale. And I do believe, I truly believe that Messi is going to be in Inter Miami. I truly believe next season, people think I'm crazy, which is fine. I am a little bit nutty, but I do see Messi coming. I do. What are your thoughts on this Gareth Bale signing? Because what I feel like for the league, it means a lot. I think it's going to start to transition. Like we were a retirement league for so long to so many people around the world. MLS is a retirement. League. Nobody goes to MLS unless they're done playing. But I think getting someone like Gareth Bale just shows that we still have something more than what people realize we offer a higher playing level than what we once did before we have changed the league has changed so what do you think that signing means to major league soccer and what are your views on that i'm not quite as um you're not i knew it. i could tell from what we talked no, earlier i'm hyped i'm hyped about about him coming okay i don't think it means as much for the future as as you do i'll, I'll explain why but, but I love the signing and I love what LAFC is doing because to me, they're in first place and they're saying they put the rest of the league on notice. And they said, they just call Mikazi to major league soccer. You, you think we're going to be okay with being the best team, you know, in end of June? No, we're going to get better. And if you guys don't get better, we're going to leave you in the dust. And I think it sets a real tone for the rest of the league to say, hey, you guys got to step it up and improve your teams, even if they're already good. So I love, I love what, what LAFC is doing. Uh, John Thornton's is a good buddy of mine. I think he's done an unbelievable job there since. Oh, LAFC has won. been crushing it. I, and, it's been crushing my heart as an LA Galaxy fan. They have been crushing <laughs> it. Yeah, no, I, I, I love what they're doing. Um, but I wouldn't say that, Gar I, I would say the perception of Garrett Bale is not this guy who's coming over in his prime from having you know, started games on Real Madrid. I think every, you know, the majority of people are thinking it didn't work out there. He was going to go to Cardiff or wherever he was going to go. It's not like he was about to go play on another world power and, you know, be one of the main guys. So I don't think it means as any is what, 33. So I don't think it, it means as much to 
the like next superstar coming, if that makes sense. But I that was gonna be my next question. Who do you think's gonna follow? Who do you think well, comes to next? To me, it's to me it's more I mean, of course you have a chance to get a Messi or Ronaldo. I don't care if they're 40 years old. It's still amazing. But to me, the the thing that will really change the league at some point in another way, like you said, David changed the league, Beckham changed the league in a, in a way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then it it's kind of catapulted the idea of a lot of these big time stars coming over in their 30s, Frank Lampard and and David Villa and Henri and the yeah. list goes on, right? Guys that are ready and not ready to stop playing, but also can't and play. We're, and we're great. And some of them were outstanding players in the league. And I think you could see you had to come and still be fit and and really be focused in order to do well. Like Villa was incredible when he came. Um, like Ger- Steven Gerrard, he didn't he didn't do that well. No. Um, he was in, you know, he's an all-time and great as well. Yeah, in the world. yeah, so... So, you know, it's not easy to come over and be successful. Um, you can't, soccer is not a sport where you can take your foot off the gas and kind of cruise and still dominate. Like, it's not like baseball where you just get up and if you have great hand-eye coordination, you can hit the ball. You have to be in shape and, and you know, be focused and, and fit uh, in order to be successful, especially in MLS, because it is a, you know, physical and fast-paced game. But I would say the thing that's going to take us to the next level is when, one of these guys comes over in their 20s. Like, if somebody comes over when the net, I don't know who it's going to be. When uh, could you, you see know, anyone? Like, if you really thought about it, it's got to, it's got to, it's going to, it like the Mbappe's and and Hollands of the world who are the next, you know, two best players in the world. I just don't see them coming in their 20s because unless something drastically changes, because those guys are going to be making. $50 million a year and they're going to be playing at the highest level. And right now the highest level is still. So in I think it will always be in Europe. I really, and I love major league soccer. I do, but I, I like, I do like that. We're kind of our own thing. I like that the highest level is still over still in Europe, but I like that MLS has built its own, its own level of high play of, um, I mean, like it can change. it's just the, the money is, uh, you know, for better or worse, that's what drives Would it. Right? Want so, it to change? What's that? Would you want it to change? Would you want it MLS to be competing at that level? Of course. A hundred percent, of course. Wow, of course. I love yeah. it. Tell me yeah, more. Of course. I mean, look, and that's what it's all about. Look, the, the best players in the world aren't necessarily European. They are some of the best, but, you know, South Americans are, but Let's they go to Europe because that's where the money is, which then yeah. creates, you know, the best leagues in the world. Same as the NHL here, the best hockey yeah. players in the world are playing in the NHL, not because Americans are necessarily the best hockey players. It's yeah, because it like, yeah, that's, it's where, that's where the money is. So the, that's where the best league is, right? So if it continues to change, and now you see all these, so many American owners are are buying EPL teams, which is widely considered, I would say, the best league in the world. I mean, there's no reason that in America – we can't be the best league in the world. I don't see it happening in the next 10 years, but I think it absolutely could. Is it, is it possible? Absolutely. Because people love, people love America. That, hey, people do love America. That's There's a reason why Gareth Bale said, hmm. I mean, honestly, if I'm going to go, I may as well go to LA for a year, try it out, live it up for a bit, practice before the World Cup. Why not? And they all talk to each other. I mean, you know, Frank Lampard told me that. He was like, you know, uh, he called David before he came and was asking about LA and when he was considering New York. And of course, those guys are going to call each other and, you know, they play with each other and ask them about their experience. And most, most everybody is saying that America is pretty amazing, you know? So I, I am proud to be an American. Shout out to 4th of July coming up very soon. <laughs> Shout out to our independence. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm biased towards America. I love America. I do too. I, I do too. Um, I'm with you. Um, before we do have to start wrapping it up. Okay. Interesting take. Um, I just completely disagree. I think because I want to see um, more change with major league soccer. Um, I do agree. I think it's going to take a lot longer than 10 years because you know, it soccer has been soccer is still the number one sport in the world, but in America, it's just always been behind baseball, behind football and, we're starting to get more viewership actually than the NHL. And I think that in itself is a victory that in itself goes to show we are in the, on the right track to get better and to be bigger. 
Um, so where do you see us in the next five years or where would you like to see us? I mean, uh, again, the, the growth has been great. I think um, the biggest thing is that we don't need to overcome or take the place of one of these other sports. Everybody always talks like that, you know, that football is bigger, baseball is bigger, basketball, whatever. To me, it's not, we have, what do we have? 350 million, 400 million people in this country. There's plenty of fans out there. Like we, and, and it's growing at a rate that's so tremendous. And this TV rights deal is gonna help getting these, these great players is gonna help. 2026 World Cup here, I think that's is gonna, gonna be massive. Be is going to be massive. And so um, where do I want to see it? I mean, I don't know. I think there's different ways to, to kind of rate where, where we're at, right, as a league and as a, a sport in this country. Um, yeah, I just, I, I don't know, very broad answer, but just continued growth and, and to where the guys are making really good money that are playing in the league. It's a, a league that's desired by players around the world, which I think it's starting to become. Yeah. Uh, maybe not for the, the, the top, top guys. Um, and, and I would love us to get to a place in the future where um, it's a it's an end goal for young Americans, too, where I think now the, the best young Americans, they still want to go to Europe. And I I understand that I would be the same way if I was them, uh, because like we, we spoke about before, the best the best football is still in Europe right now. Yeah. But I would love that to change at some point. And I, it will. I, I don't know when, but it will. It will be great when at least half of those guys, let's say, are guys that, want, want to stay. that their goal, not just that end up staying, but that their goal is to, to play their whole career in MLS. And again, to me, the biggest difference is going to be when one or two of these, you know, 25 year olds, uh, the next, I don't think it'll be Mbappe or, or Holland. But when that next guy uh, comes along and he says, I'm gonna play in America at, in my 20s, in my prime, then I think it'll start to change and, and more and more guys will come. I agree with you. And I think actually I did wanna to talk to you about the World Cup and I wish we had more time. But yes. um, obviously I think one, us making it into the World Cup is huge. It's huge for soccer in America. And it's huge for the reason that I, I agree. We have so many fans that do love soccer. I know that. I know that being a fan, but I think it's taken a lot longer for people to just respect it as a sport because I don't want to watch a sport that ends in a tie. I don't like watching a sport where guys fall on the floor. I've heard so many reasonings why people don't want to watch soccer, but I think we're finally starting to get the respect that we've always deserved or the sport has always deserved. But I think us getting into the World Cup helps us that much more. And us hosting the World Cup is also going to catapult people genuinely following and loving soccer. Now, we've made it to the World Cup. We had to make it to the World Cup after we did not qualify. And that was very, very painful. Very painful. Now, we have what, we have the youngest team in the World Cup, which is insane to me. Because yeah. you're right. It's going to take the younger players to get to a level that want to stay in MLS for us to start to grow. But now our team is young. Like we have a young, good team and that's what qualified us for the World Cup. And I am proud to say that I am proud of the team that we have built. Me too. But you have been following the sport probably longer than I have. And I am very curious. We have a good team going. I love the current players that we have, but I do miss some of our former players. Shout out to Howard. Loved <laughs> watching him in the net. If you could create your own World Cup team, you're sending him off in November. They're going to Qatar. Who do you have representing our country? Let's start uh, with the back. Let's start with the back. I'll start you yeah. off with the goalie and move your way Yeah, okay. so we have the position. Yeah, I think it would be hard to not to go with, with Tim Howard. Um, he just is, you know, such a stud, was such a great player for so many years, and his actual World Cup performances. We're insane. We'll, we'll say we'll say Tim and goal. Got to go with, with Bees on the left, Demarcus Beasley. Uh, I think he played in four World Cups, which is unreal, and – uh he's he's a friend of mine and a guy that I, not that we were ever super close but that i played uh with and against for a long time since we were about 17 so um yeah what a what a career he had and then here's here's where my shocker is gonna come in and uh and, and i mentioned the name before i would have chad marshall okay in my, in my team for me he's the greatest ever american defender he's not the most accomplished, but in, in pure ability, 
to me, he's he's the greatest. Um, and and I would have him on, on my team. And then I'm gonna go with our guy from Rock Nation, Chris Richards, <laughs> him, who uh, hopefully will be healthy and, and playing in this World Cup coming up. But Chris is gonna be a, a stud for years to come. And then on the right, I gotta go with LAFC zone, Steve Chirundolo. He was uh, as a as an outside back uh, a hero of mine and a guy that I always looked up to. Uh, I think per, per position, I think he was actually the best player on the team. Uh, obviously, usually your outside back isn't is in your best player, but he was a phenomenal player. And then um, I'm gonna be a little bit biased in the middle. I'll have uh, my guy Kyle Beckerman in there. World Cup vet. <laughs> I love Beckerman. Yeah, I think he's great. Yeah. He, he had a great, uh, great World Cup in, in 2014 uh, and helped us make a run there. Uh, and then, gosh, this is tough. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have Musa in there with him. I think this kid is going to be, for me, like top player in the world. Really? I think, I think he's. Drop the name. Everyone who's listening, drop I think the he's name. Like, he reminds me of like Iniesta and some of these like greats where he's back in our own 18 and dribbling out, like not even phased, Eunice Musa. I mean, he, like to me, he's, uh, he's so he's big time. to watch. Okay. Yeah. So um, I would have him in there. And then who would be the other guy in there? This is so tough. Um, oh gosh. I think I'd have. It's fine. I, it's, I, I love asking this question. This is, yeah, this is tough. I think maybe I'd have, I'd have, uh, Oh man, I might play. I might play Tyler Adams and Kyle behind Musa, or I would play. I would play Musa, and then I play. Uh, I play Gio Reyna. Uh, oh, Gio Reyna's Healthy. I think he's going to be a real difference maker for us for many years to come, and I think he already is Proving top himself. three talent for us. Um, and then I'd have Christian on the left. Pulisic. I'd have. Uh, I'd have Deuce up top. I think, and uh, I'd have Landon on the right. Okay, I was gonna say I was. I feel like I. People have always said Howard Pulisic, and Landon. I was like, dang, is he not gonna say that? Yeah, now Landon's. I mean, you can't. So you can't make a team without him. I mean, he. It's he so just, absurd that he wasn't in the 2014 team. I mean, he had, he had he more World been. Cup. I was so absurd. He, he had more World Cup goals at that point than players had caps that I will maybe- never understand it because we had a really solid run in 2014. I mean, a solid run and we could have had a further run. I think had we had added him. Cause like you said, not only did he have the experience, he was still playing well. I don't know. Oh, what you know. He, was, he still would have been one of the best players on the team. This, yeah. so to, put, to put that in perspective for you, this is pretty cool. Cause Kyle Beckerman didn't know for sure if he was going to make the team right until the very mm-hmm. end, obviously he ended up being a starter, but you never know. And of course you're, you're anxious. And you, I think at the time what was at 2014. So we were like 32. So that's going to be his last chance at making it. And he told me when he found out and he realized, of course, he's like elated or whatever. And then right after it hit, it hit him that Landon didn't make the team. And he goes, Chris, it was so weird. I got this like weird feeling of like, like depression almost. or like this, this like absence of, end like, of an era. Like, if anybody deserves to be here, yeah. like Landon and, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool to hear that. And they had grown up playing together since on the national team since we were like 15, 16. Um, and just the respect that was there. But I think everybody felt that way. So for sure, Landon would be would be on that team. And he, he also provided, I guess it was Tim Dempsey and Landon that provided my greatest fanhood moment of my life with that goal in, in 2010. Um, I, rem- I remember exactly where I was. I was in the locker room at Real Salt Lake, and I was punting the physio balls. <laughs> incredible. Well, I love that. I'm glad. That I love asking that question. Um, I, I feel like I need to make, like, a video of every single one of your guys' answers and have it, like, on a full video where That's, everyone can I'm leaving a lot off there. I feel – first of all, I love our team right now. I'm, I'm telling you, and I think I the most so. exciting thing about 2026 is, is the fact that those guys are all going to be in their prime. So we got, now there's so many things that have to fall into place. So like, you know, I mean, Italy's one of the best teams in the world. They didn't even make it. Uh, fortunately, I know. Automatically qualified, but it's so difficult to even get out of your group and all this stuff. Right. So people are asking, and it's fun to ask and chat about people. Like, oh, how far are we going to go? And I'm like, well, who knows? But I do think we are good enough 
to go to a, a semifinal. And I, you, know. you could never get to a semifinal. Anything could happen, right? So do I think we're going to win the World Cup? No, but uh, Not this time around. a great team. And I think it's going to be really exciting and enough that it's going to create an unbelievable buzz around America, which is exciting. I cannot wait. I can't wait. I'm actually trying to go to Qatar. So I've been manifesting it. Um, obviously, I know a few people who work with Fox Sports. Yeah. And every time I'm with anyone who works, I'm like, hey, so like, if I fly <laughs> there, I pay for everything else, likelihood of me getting a ticket. Yeah. Like, I'll fly there. I will get my hotel. I'll do it all. So, um, so far, I've, I've, I've planted the seeds everywhere, a little bit everywhere. It's everywhere. Let's see if it, it comes into a garden for me. I'll so let you know if I'm going to be there. I'll let you know. Oh, yeah. Let me know. I'll, I'll let you know if I end up getting a ticket. So uh, we'll have to connect. Yeah. Oh, my God. That'd be so fun in Qatar. Okay. Now, we always end my segment with questions. So we have people in the chat right now. Um, hey, everyone. Sorry, I've not been reading the chat. Obviously, I'm very focused in on the interview. Um, but I do see a few of you guys dropped questions for Chris. So let's ask you those questions first. We have one from Mickey. Mickey says, as a defender, who was your inspiration from the European side? if you had one there and your state side inspiration as well? Well, I never really wanted to play defense. I feel like Happy Gilmore, like, uh, you know, pretending I was a midfielder and, and everybody's like, no, you're a defender. And I tell the guys now that I won't play men's league with them unless I'm playing midfield or forward because I don't want to play defense anymore. But uh, so really my inspiration didn't come from defenders. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say my – my inspiration when I was young, uh, my, my high school coach was a, an excellent coach and he used to study all the great Dutch footballers. So I watched all those guys in the young Ajax teams, uh, the DeBoer brothers and, and Burkamp and Overmars and, and Davids and all these guys. And then Yari Litmanen, who was Finnish, but, but played on Ajax for a long time. So um, a bunch of those guys. And the 92, uh, the class of 92 for Man United, I love that team as well. They were my favorite team growing up uh, and watching the treble in 99. But, I, yeah, as a defender, um, I don't think I really had a, a, a single inspiration. Uh, my college coach was an, an incredible uh, defensive-minded coach and really helped me learn the defensive side of the game. And then, like I said before, having Robin Frazier as a mentor and a coach uh, on, and a teammate um, when I was in Columbus – uh, I think really helped with uh, with everything in terms of defense. Well, I love that answer. I didn't know. I, I did read that you were not originally a defender, but I didn't know that you didn't want to be a defender. I never played defense until I was 20 years old. Oh, so wow. I, I started playing center back on St. John's because we had lost our two center backs. And then that's when I got called into the national team for the first time. So I was like, well, I'm not complaining because I wasn't. <laughs> You're like, keep me back. Field. That's fine. And, and then and I never played outside back, but I'm a little bit small for a center back. So I think they just thought, oh, we could play outside back. And I was super uncomfortable there. And then that's where I played most of my career. Actually, Garth Lagaway, who was our general manager for many years in Salt Lake and has been the, uh, you know, the brain trust behind these great Seattle teams. Uh, he said towards the end of my career, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll probably play you some more at center back next year. And I said, great. And he was like, you sound pretty excited. And I was like, I hate outside back. And he was like, what? You, you've been playing there forever. I didn't know that. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to complain. I, I'm the best position is to be on the field. Somebody told me that when I was little. And oh, I love that. I took that, took that to heart. I'd much rather be starting at outside back than be on the bench and playing midfield. You're like, Throw me anywhere, coach. Exactly. Throw me in. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is from Brandon. Neymar, Messi, or Ronaldo? Who is your favorite player of those three? Oh, I think, oh, uh, wow. Well, I love Ronaldo because he's been on Man U, and they're still um, probably my favorite European team, although they've been hard to root for as of late. But I, uh, I've, I've rooted for him um, more than those guys in terms of uh, being on one of my favorite teams. But Messi's the greatest ever for me. And oh, Neymar... You. Yeah, Neymar is uh, unbelievable as well. And what he did at such a young age with Brazil and to carry, you know, a whole country of that size on his back, um, which, you know, most people would say is, if not the greatest, certainly right there is the greatest footballing nation in the world. To, to handle that pressure and succeed the way he did is unheard of. So I, 
I, that's a long answer. I would say it's maybe, I don't know if he's my favorite, but he's, he, to, to me, Messi's the greatest. I'm with you. All great players, very great players in their own right. But Messi, for me, same thing. Um, I forgot. I think it was Jay Demerit was on here, and he said that till this day when he played against Messi, he said it was just different. He's like playing against a Ronaldo, playing against, you know, other well-known players. He said, but Messi was like, was like magic. Man, we, when we lost in that Champions League final in 2011 to Monterey, if we had won, we would have went to the Club World Cup, like Seattle's going to go to now, you know? Mm-hmm. And we would have played against Barcelona. And hey, I was playing, and I was, and I was playing left back, and he was, you know, plays right wing, basically. Yeah. So I would have got completely embarrassed, but it would have been pretty cool. Hey, you know what? When he ends up in Inter Miami, you never know what can happen. Rock Nation <laughs> can just go down there and be like, we're just going to have a, a meeting yeah. with Messi. We'll okay. So, last thing we're going to get into are rapid questions. Are they fire questions or rapid questions? Fire questions. I think you say fire questions. They're every fire time. questions, right? I mean, they're rapid fire questions. Rapid so, fire, I guess technically so it's kind both. Of the same. <laughs> Thanks, um, Nick. <laughs> You know, that's what I'm here for. I know. I'm here for the support. Nick, do you mind putting a timer on for me for one minute? Yeah, you guys ready? Are you ready, Chris? I'm ready. We're just going to shoot them. You're not going to have time to think. Yeah. I, I try, I've gone through them every time, except for once, actually. We're going to yeah. get through them. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Okay, coffee or tea? Coffee. Uh, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? No. Winter or summer? Summer. Favorite holiday? Christmas. Galaxy or LAFC? LAFC. Damn. Pulisic or Donovan? Oh, uh, Landon. Madrid or Barcelona? Barcelona. LA or New York City? New York. Vanilla or chocolate? Chocolate. Spirit animal? Oh, cheetah. 30 seconds. Uh, Messi or Ronaldo? Messi. Lakers or Clippers? Lakers. Biggest pet peeve? Slow walkers. <laughs> Biggest fear? Uh, tearing my Achilles. 15. Worst school subject? English. Greatest school subject? 10. Math. Math? Math. Red or white wine? Red. Uh, margarita on the rocks or blended? Uh, blended. Whiskey or tequila? Oh, dang, I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> we actually did. I want you guys to know we did finish all the questions. And then I was just coming off the top of my head asking some. You added a few in. I had to add a few in, yeah. Dang, go Chris. We accomplished all of them. Heck yeah. All right, Chris, before you go, um, where can everyone who is here go and find you to support you on social medias? Uh, What's my handle? Uh, Wingert17, I think is. Wingert17. Wingert17, 17. Okay, Winger at 17, you guys. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for her jumping on and talking soccer with me for the last hour. It was a lot of fun, and hopefully I can bring you on again sometime because I feel like you and I could talk for a long time. Absolutely. We'll do it in person next time. Yes. Yeah, we're actually based yeah. in L.A., so you can definitely come into the studio. I love it's always it. an option. So next time you're here, I'll, I'll, tra- I'll definitely hit you up. I'll be back out soon. All right, thanks for having me. Of course. Bye, Chris. Take care. See you later. All right, you guys, that was so much fun. Uh, what, does, what does that say? Proud what? Proud fan. Oh, my God. Big show, Brandon. You know what it looks like you said from here? Proud fart. And I was like, a proud fart? <laughs> what does that mean? I literally was looking at that like, what did he just type in the chat? Proud fart. And I was literally thinking of what it could mean. <laughs> but he said proud fan. <laughs> You might have to rename the name of your podcast to Pam on the Pimp after you started pimping out your grandma earlier. Dude, you guys, my grandma is single. She's bilingual. She's great. She has two knees, new knees, robo knees. <laughs> it's not It's not Pam on the Pitch anymore. It's Pam on the Pimp. Pam on the Pimp. I will pimp out anyone's grandma, especially mine. She's um, dual citizenship as well. Um, she loves to cut. And the list goes on. The list goes, you guys, 85 and feeling fine. She looks amazing, loves Elvis, diehard Elvis fan, um, loves music, uh, literally has her Bluetooth speaker in her kitchen. She'll play it and go clean the house. She's incredible, you guys, incredible. So if you know anyone, any eligible bachelors, listen, hit me up. My grandma's available and we can set them up on a blind date. Now, I wanted to go into detail about Gareth Bale because I do disagree 
with Chris. I do love his perspective, but I think it is really big for Major League Soccer. I do. I do. I do. I do. I think that there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, unfortunately, I do have to take my grandma to the movie theaters at 630. So I do have to wrap up the show. To Stephanie, to Big Show Brandon, Mickey, I saw you in there. Bunk to Z, Lamb Chop, Ben. Uh, my mom, I think, was in there. Pilar, I know I saw Pilar in there at some point. If I missed your name, I am so sorry, you guys. But we do have to wrap it up. Next week on the show, I think I'm going to just focus on the Gareth Bale signing. Um, I think there's a lot I want to say about it. I actually might bring on a guest who's a Galaxy fan because LA Galaxy has been struggling. Now, Chris is right. LASC making that move is huge. I think that sets the tone. I think it sends a mes- message to the entire league. He literally, com- they kamikaze the league. Like, league has been, like, blown up, in my opinion. So the league needs to take action. When I say the league, I mean all the other teams, specifically LA Galaxy. Um, the transfer deadline or, like, the international transfer deadline is July 7th. So next week, that is what we're going to talk about. I want to go over what all this growth is doing and what players like Gareth Bale coming to MLS means for Major League Soccer. So thank you to everyone who was here. I appreciate and love you guys so much for the support. Nick, thank you for helping me out with the show today um, and every week. You're incredible. Great team. Teamwork here. That's what I'm here for. (laughs) All right, you guys. Until next week, thank you again for joining Pam on the Pitch. That was incredible. I thought you really did.